pump handle. Yeah. We've got a very clear piece of ribbing. We have the crank. We have the very interesting amount mm -hmm. of clearance mm -hmm. here where it becomes clear beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's only one side mm -hmm. that these guys were on. Yeah. We have an area of bench. So right. Let's try to, there's okay. Three, three things that we can. Cover. All right. So we're we're rolling. All right. Well, so obviously you see here you've got uh, the pump handle mm -hmm. for uh, uh, the pump to pump the seawater back out. Once it uh, was in the ballast ballast tank, they would use this. Open the valve, pump the seawater out. Mm -hmm. um, this mechanism here is all the plumbing and the, the piping to let the seawater either in or out for the ballast tanks. Uh, obviously, this is your hand crank. We now know there are seven positions uh, instead of eight on the hand crank. Since the hand crank is off center, is on the starboard side and the bench on the port side, they obviously had to transfer the energy from the hand crank uh, to the propeller shaft. And here you can see the gears from uh, the gear on the uh, hand crank and then the gear for the propeller shaft there. Uh, which would be their mechanism for transferring that uh, that energy. Uh, you can see roughly down in here these, these large rectangular shapes, uh, or probably ballast, that uh, they had in the submarine uh, for ballasting. Um, one of our puzzle, one of the things we're puzzling over is why the ballast seems to be on the starboard side. You would think already too much weight's on the starboard side because the bench is there and that's where the men would be sitting. Uh, one of the mysteries we're going to have to solve uh, is is how they distributed weight so that the submarine didn't all didn't roll to one side. Uh, you know, they, these guys were really pretty smart. They're some of the best engineers at their time, some of the best engineers in the South. They put a lot of uh, state-of-the-art technology into the design of this submarine. So one of the problems they had to solve was uh, the ballasting of the submarine. And, uh, you know, there's some things going on here we don't fully understand yet. Uh, probably what you see here, they had uh, the records say that they could drop the keel weights, uh, and what we may be seeing here is actually a lever for dropping the keel weights. So they would have weights on the exterior of the hull. The uh, the actual keel, yes, can are, are, are heavy iron weights that can be dropped uh, from the inside. Now, how successfully you can do that from the inside, uh, they certainly didn't do it on this mission. Uh, in one of the sinkings, they apparently tried to get them off, but, but couldn't get them all the way turned. So it may not have been that easy. Uh, one of the things that's missing so far is the control rods for the rudder. We're speculating now that those may actually be under the bench, uh, but we're still waiting to see until we uh, continue that excavation there, uh, whether we've got the control rods there. One of the drawings by Alexander that was done 40 years after the building of the submarine shows the control rods for the rudder on the top, um, but um, we didn't find them there. Uh, so the, next, the only other place they could be is be under the bench, or somehow there's a, a handle somewhere where the guy back here could control the rudder based on orders from uh, Lieutenant Dixon. Mm -hmm. I can lower my camera and I just don't touch anything, right? Uh, yeah. Just don't touch anything. Right. I can get shot like this. I'm not touching anything. Okay, so you want to lean forward so he can see us better. Yeah, be Why don't you lean forward and look look that direction? Yeah. And uh, you can see you can see how you can see how confined you really get an idea how confined this submarine is. Putting your head in and looking to the end of it, it's, it's hard to imagine anybody could even fit themselves in here. Uh, What's the average height of the uh, of the North American male in uh, in uh, 1860? Well, we know that we know. I think you've fallen probably <laughs> coming around here to somewhat shorter than today. But Dixon himself was uh, supposed to be six feet tall. Uh, we you know estimate now that some of these guys are probably average height or maybe a little shorter than average. But what we're seeing from some of the skeletal remains is these guys are very muscular. So even if they were even if they were short, they were very strong and. Uh, uh, stocky, well-built um, individuals. It probably took a lot of strength to uh, turn these hand cranks, and a lot of these guys may have been uh, sailors as well as uh, soldiers. So they probably had well-developed upper bodies. Is it, is it possible that the ballast tanks are going to be off-center in this to, to help balance again? Well, it's a good idea. That that is an, that's an excellent thought, uh, but we really don't know. We really don't know at this point. Uh, but because obviously sometimes the ballast tanks would be empty. Mm -hmm. But that is a good thought that they could have put them off center. Uh, we, you know, we also thinking about the possibility of there being an air exchange system that runs under the bench, since we seem to have with our bellows uh, forward, we seem to have a um, um, a lot of um, a hose that runs towards the area under the bench.
how sophisticated was that system if you actually had a, an, an air system that was uh, that ran from station to station and that expelled uh, uh, used air and uh, and brought in fresh air well I think it's very sophisticated it's, it's the basics you got to understand you know the exchange of air uh, and they were doing it with uh, the technology they had at the time which was uh, you know manpower uh, working a very large bellows um, so it was it was very sophisticated much more sophisticated than anything we thought about uh, we know that other people in the Civil War were uh, experimenting in, in submarines with using uh, air purifiers um, rebreathers perhaps if you have it uh, but using uh, say carbolic acid to purify the air um, so th these guys that these guys had all the right ideas they didn't always they had to use 19th century technologies uh, to accomplish that so it, you know it, it's very in a lot of ways very Jules Verne like uh, with, the, with the technologies uh, they had the right con the right concepts uh, but they were certainly using what technologies they had available in the 19th century with which to do it um, and interesting thought too about Jules Verne's 20,000 leagues under the sea that uh, you know he was probably well aware of Hunley and the you know, submarine development in the Civil War and this probably in influenced his writing a great deal Interesting. Another, another interesting connection. Yeah. Well, you can see that the hull is, is very graceful, very slender, you know, fine uh, entrance and, and run. Uh, you know, the, um, the ends of the vessel are almost cutting edge, blade edged. These are all of the, all, all of the plates butt ended? All, all of the plates are butt joined together with a backing plate behind them. Uh, and again, this makes for a, a very smooth um, hull. All the rivets are countersunk uh, or, or ground smooth with the hull so you don't have any protrusions for marine growth on it. These are actually datums that we put in uh, for measuring. But again, you can see the hull is very, very uh, slender. Uh, butt joins between the hull plates with uh, backing plate to which to rivet the uh, hull plates together. And was there a plate above this, or was, was this just... There, there was a plate here that we took off. That's right. But, but no, there was no there plate was no above color. it. No. Okay. There, there, it was straight, straightly butted together, uh, and you can only faintly see the lines through the uh, concretion. On the sub. Another feature that we found were, were these frames for strengthening the hull, uh, going down any depth that they would need uh, some strengthening structures inside uh, for you know, counter compression. Uh, these certainly did it. Uh, they made a lot of sense. We had no idea they were in here, though, until we opened it up. Did, did, each, uh, did each plate have two? Each, each plate had uh, two viewing ports, two glass viewing ports. Um, that's okay, fiber optic. That's, yeah. uh, it's fiber optic light. Yeah, it, it was turned off up there. If I could turn it on, I'd shine. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, there are five pair of what we call dead lights, and these allowed light into the submarine. We also believe that they could. Uh, they had a cover on the inside that they could close these lights off, so they wouldn't be uh, as visible to an enemy ship. Um, and uh, we have some indication some of those were, were closed. Uh, there are also these uh, these dead lights or viewing ports were in the uh, conning towers too. Can we go forward and take a look at the conning tower and at the at the shear of the bow? Sure, it'd be great. Okay, here we go. We've got. Uh, you can see how fine the end is here. It's how, how narrow and sleek. And um, you can see the cut water in front of the conning tower here. We have also a cut water that was in front of the uh, after conning tower. Can we get a shot of the, of the conning tower and the air exchange box? And one of the things, too, you might notice on the dive planes, uh, if you look up here, there's, uh, there's fins in front of the dive planes that would uh, prevent it, uh, lines from fouling in the dive plane. These are on both sides. Are those? Were there any uh, movable hydroplanes on the on the bow or on the stern? Or only on the stern roof. Well, only these dive planes. There are only these dive planes can be moved. Now we may have some fins, like stabilizer fins, on the stern. We have something there on the stern that could be a stabilizer fin. So these these concreted. Uh, Planes where they, they they were actually on a pivot. And, and yeah, there's a there's so a. Were the dive planes. These are the dive planes. Okay. They're six foot. Each one is six foot long. There's an axle connecting the two dive planes. Uh, there, where uh, we've got a gentleman working under uh, taking off that plate. There is a handle for the dive planes so that uh, one individual can uh, can raise or lower the dive planes.
probably the guy that would have uh, also controlled the bellows, could have also manipulated the dive planes. So Gene, uh, there's a fin. I was talking about there's a dive plane there. You see the axle on the dive plane? Yeah, this, this thing, this big thing here is a dive plane. Mm -hmm. It's about six feet long. In front of it is a fin that uh, that's fixed that would prevent uh, that would prevent lines from fouling in the dive plane from hanging in it. So it basically just make it the camera. If a line drug across it, it would kick the line off the um, off the dive plane. What do you expect the from the inside? Can you see what the what the interior uh, dimension of the oval shaped uh, hatchway is? Uh, well, we have X-rayed that area, but we're not that far forward in our excavation. Okay, it's it's very small though. Remarkable. Not only take someone uh, somewhat slender, but someone that's probably uh, very flexible. Hey, Kellen, is, is Warren? Okay, I'm okay with another people. One of the reasons I want to introduce you to John is So the pump handle, do you think that that was a handle that went uh, horizontally back and forth um, when they utilized it? Because obviously right now, if you were trying to run the crank, if you were actually trying to turn the propeller, that, would, that handle would be in your way. So did, did you, if it was run in a rhythmic way, like uh, shooting a machine gun through the blades of a propeller, uh, you could... Uh, you could maintain the use of it and and uh, and pump and uh, ballast and and crank at the same time, but that would take a well coordinated line. It would take a pretty yeah pretty well coordinated effort between uh, both the crew who are cranking and the individual who's actually uh, running the pump. The thing about it is um, this particular station right here, this last. Uh, so the last crank position, the individual who sat there would, in fact, be the one who pumped the ballast tanks. Likely what they probably did was um, they would probably stop, slow down or stop at least momentarily long enough for the person to start pumping the ballast tank before they, um, before they resume cranking again. Mm -hmm. As to what direction it goes, whether it goes horizontally or vertically, is very hard to say at this point. We don't really know. Far too much iron concretion on it at this point to really determine uh, how, it, how it functions. But the fact of stratigraphy right there offers quite a bit of clues, uh, some very good clues as to how the sub filled up the sediment after it sank. Is this the area where you found some valves that looked like they were open inappropriately? Uh, actually, it's a good question. I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, they may, in fact, have found valves here. This would be an excellent location for them. Well, if you, I don't know whether you've ever been in an oxygen-deprived state. <laughs> Decisions get awfully hard to make. It's really... Uh, they get rushed. Yeah. And uh, so if something did happen to their air supply or, or anything like that, you can, you can become quite confused quite quickly. Quite easy, to, easy to make bad judgments. Very much so. Well, there's also other factors involved, too. The second conning tower is right here. I mean, if somebody really was desperate enough, they may have tried to actually open the hatch and get out of the sub. Is there any indication that that hatch... Uh, right. right. That to well, if there was any individual in the sub who had any degree of mobility, it would have been Lieutenant Dixon in the forward part of the sub. The rest of these guys were pretty much contained... Uh, by the crank assembly, there weren't very many places they could go in, in, a, uh, in an emergency situation. Dixon was the only one who really would have had a chance to maybe open up a hatch and try to get out, or, or the guy in the number eight position, but uh, Dixon would have had a better chance. Yeah, did you get the two, you got, I know you did, get the two gearing mechanisms there that, the, the, uh, that takes us... From one end to the other, right? Yeah. 
this is just incredible. We can get this out. Well, I'm uh, I'm just amazed that you could get uh, eight guys, nine guys into this thing and actually have them be able to function. Okay, and actually, so move only it. in warfare. Yeah, this kind of development takes place only in warfare. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's it's a testament to a lot of things. Uh, definitely ingenuity during wartime, but certainly a testament to the individuals who are actually in the sub, particularly knowing its history. I mean, uh, you know, two two prior crew, two possibly three. Really, possibly that, three. Well, two confirmed. Yeah. Um, Of that. Quint quintessential, it's, absolutely. It's the quintessential time capsule. Uh, it, it truly is. I mean, it is sealed up. <laughs> yes, the things we call scattering at the time, and scatter artifacts and move them from where they originally came to rest. This is not the case of here. Everything is exactly as it is. Yeah. It's incredible to me. We, we have been doing shipwreck shows for years, yeah. years and years and years, so we uh, have a really good sense of them. And one of the things, the other thing that's so impressive about this wreck is that it's actually being preserved. We were, we just were surveying uh, for the Lodner Phillips of the 1848 sub that was lost in Lake Erie, and uh, we didn't find it. We think it's completely in, in sediment. Yeah, that's probably and Unfortunately, it's sitting right next to the, the Atlantic, the ship I described to you, which has a massive magnetic signature. So we, uh, it's lost, and so we have to come go back with some really low frequency sonar and start to just do a look, just look for it that way. There's some sub bottom stuff yeah. too that I might tell you something. Well that's that's where well, that's it. Oh uh, there's a good shot of the prop on this side which is nice. Because the to get that hydroplane is really nice. Phillips had an 1846 patent on a ruddering system and, and, uh, and propeller system for sub in the U.S., which might have influenced it. And it was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Incredible. <laughs> Strange to see this sub in that Chapman painting. I had to draw the Hunley from, uh -huh. you know, just that's about the minimum size that I would think to make it. Yeah. it like, you know, but look at it, it's half again this small. Nothing like that, yeah. Uh, apart. I can't believe. So were there nine people overall in this thing? There were nine people in it. There were eight people cranking, and there was one person Actually, who was a commander. Yeah. Well, except, except both of which we have examples of. I have a, a, a CD of those, some of those images. Yeah, yeah, the candles are just, the candle was gorgeous. I was the one that found that, actually. Nice. <laughs> That's much more fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fun. You pick that thing up. Well, <laughs> you're just there. You know what I'm saying. Well, yeah, when I found it, it was weird. I just kind of sitting there going, now, what is that? Because we had areas that were called biotribation.